for the session. Uh, uh, if anyone has any problem, please let us know. And also, I'm going to ask from everyone to turn off uh, your cameras and mute so that we don't affect the uh, bandwidth or I don't know the speed. This is what I'm told. I don't know if this is real, but this is what I'm told. And Christina, if you can uh, uh, use full screen for so that the heading uh, appears as a full screen. So I would like to welcome uh, Christina. She's a uh, AUB graduate. Christina had her uh, undergraduate degree in economics and her uh, master's degree in uh, environmental sciences, ecosystem management. Uh, Christina's advisor is Professor Yasser Abu Nasser. Uh, he is a landscape architect and he is the chair of the Department of Landscape Design and Ecosystem Management. And today she will be presenting to us uh, her uh, research of her thesis research uh, around um, ecosystem approach to assess uh, biosphere reserve management in uh, Jabal Musa. Please go ahead, uh, Christina. We will, if you don't mind, we will leave the questions to last. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salma. So, hello everyone. My name is Christina Majdalani, and basically, I'll be presenting my thesis, uh, which talks about applying an ecosystem approach to assess biosphere reserve management, the case of Jabal Musa. Before we begin, this is my outline. So basically, I'll start by introducing the topic with the objective and research question. Then I'll briefly go and talk about the background information, which talks about the establishment and importance of biosphere reserves and how to manage biosphere reserves. What are the four different types of ecosystem services? Uh, what's the link between ecosystem services and biosphere reserves? How to map such ecosystem services? And how does mapping enhance the management in biosphere reserves? And a few case studies on sustainable agriculture in biosphere reserves. Uh, later, I'll talk about my methodology uh, and how I extracted my data. And then I'll talk about Jabal Musa and then discuss my results and finally conclude with some recommendations. So basically, what are biosphere reserves? So the concept of a biosphere reserve is basically inclusive of communities to uh, promote a balanced relationship between man and nature. And as we all know, basically, that biosphere reserves have three interrelated zones. We have the core area or areas, because a biosphere reserve can have more than one core area, a buffer area, and a transition area. However, sometimes we see that in biosphere reserves, there are challenges to management and we see conflicts between managers and residents. And why is that so? If we look at services, specifically in agriculture, we can see that these ecosystem services are destroying biodiversity, causing dispute between managers and residents, and difficult to determine and map such ecosystem services. So basically, the objective of my study was to map the provisioning services that focus mainly on agriculture production in order to assess whether there's a basis of conflict between residents and managers, and if there are challenges, are there are any challenges team of the biosphere reserve. Hence, my, uh, research, my study uh, tends to answer the question, how can mapping food production in, in biosphere reserves uh, enhance uh, the management decisions uh, uh, to ensure long-term uh, ecosystem service provisioning. Let's go a bit in the, uh, with the background information and understand more about biosphere reserves. So if we look back in 1974, we know that UNESCO's map established the biosphere reserve in order to protect the ecosystem services for people to be able to share some environmental knowledge with each other and to promote sustainable use of natural resources. Now, how can we manage such biosphere reserves? So basically, uh, the biosphere reserves management system has to be open, changing and adaptive in order to better respond to any pressures that might impact uh, the area, either ecologically or culturally. And uh, there are four 
uh, managing a biosphere reserve, basically the conservation of habitats, the logistical cohesion and synchronization, the sustainable economic and human development and climate change mitigation and adaptation. So what are the four different types of ecosystem services? Basically, we have the provisioning services, such as food and water. We have the regulating services, such as flood control, drought protection, disease prevention, and so on. We have the supporting services, such as nutrient cycling and soil development, and cultural services, uh, such as uh, spiritual, recreational, as well as many other benefits. Now that's great. We understand what's a bicycle reserve, what are the ecosystem services. Now what's the link between these two? If we dig deeper, we can see that ecosystem services help us to monitor and analyze the ecosystem's health, and it allows us to better understand how the, these bicycle reserves are working in order to better support nature and man. So basically they're very the biosphere reserve because they can capture the benefits of protected land and managed properties as well as different trade-offs and connections between these different areas of use. So how can we uh, map these ecosystem services? We have four uh, different types of uh, four different methods. Basically we have the proxy based method, the statistical models, the causal relationships and the biophysical models. Uh, I'll be using the biophysical models as we'll see later on with the slides. So uh, now that we've seen the different ways of mapping ecosystem services, how can we use these four different methods to basically enhance or improve the biosphere reserve? So basically, uh, the, uh, the mapping uh, strategies allow managers be, to visualize the distribution of different services within the biosphere reserve and to help them uh, help the managers to uh, analyze them better in order to manage the reserve better. So I took uh, three different case studies from uh, three different countries uh, to check uh, how, uh, how there was like sustainable agriculture and biosphere reserves. So if we look basically in China, we can see them over there was uh, that there were several conflicts between the administration of the biosphere reserve and locals over access to natural resources. And for managers, the solution was basically to promote agriculture production and techniques, which uh, improved the local livelihoods over there. And if we take the case of Germany, for example, the river landscape LB Biosphere Reserve, we can see that the problem over there was that 70% of land was used for intensive agriculture, which damaged all of the lands. So basically the solution for uh, managers was basically to restore the landscape through developing sustainable agriculture systems. For example, they use traditional use of grassland, new creation of pasture landscape for grazing livestock and water level management. Now, if we look uh, in Colombia, the sea flower biosphere reserve, we can see that the problem over there was that locals were en engaging in very poor agriculture practices. So what over there was basically they integrated effective uh, agriculture methods with very low tag alter alternatives in order to enhance the socioeconomic and conservation benefits of the locals over there. So methodology of my study and how I extracted my data. So basically step one was the materials and data, of course. So I tried to acquire the land use land cover map from us. However, once I got this, these maps, I came to realize that they did not have a sufficient re, uh, resolution, nor did they have the, all the information I needed that will allow me to better analyze the biosphere reserve and recommend uh, good things for managers in order to better manage it. So basically what I did was that I got an image from Google Earth of Jabal Musa. The targeted month was basically in August because it had a clear view of the vegetation and it's during this month where most crops grow. And basically I used the ArcGIS software with on layers, the APJ, APJM team. Um, and the, finally I used the investor. So the second step in my methodology was basically selecting the primary ecosystem services in Jabal Musa. So when I initially started with my study, I was able to identify 21 different ecosystem services in Jabal Musa as shown in the table below. 
However, uh, this study is mainly going to focus on apples and tomatoes because it was evident that the, these ecosystem services were very important to the locals since they were a means to food and income and for which ecological data was available and uh, could be collected due to several constraints and limitations uh, due to COVID, lockdown, and so on. So, and how can, how can services now that I identified them? So basically uh, what I did was I generated a land use land cover map from ArcGIS using a supervised where more than 50 training samples were chosen in the Sentinel-2 image that I got from Google Earth, uh, where I drew uh, polygons uh, to characterize the different sample areas of the various different land cover types to be classed. And then I used the maximum likelihood classifier, which was used to generate uh, spectral signatures, which were then used to categorize all the pixels in the Sentinel-2 image. Now that's great, and I got, a, I got the land use land cover map. However, this is not uh, sufficient or enough. Like one cannot count on what he sees on a computer, right? I need to uh, go down to the field and verify that everything I've mapped is correct. So what I did was uh, I interviewed several holders, including the APJM team, uh, farmers, mayors, women, youth, village chiefs and mayors, which all the, uh, assisted me in mapping the ecosystem services using ArcGIS web map. And basically the farmers also mentioned different agriculture plants which they grow, such as strawberries, apples, tomatoes, plum, peach, cucumber, and so on, which was also helpful in mapping out the food uh, supply. Now that I did the ArcGIS and I did the field work, it was time to overlay both maps to get the final and which included everything. So what I, I saw on the computer and what the stakeholders have told me during fieldwork. But this wasn't enough. It's great that I was able to map the ecosystem services. However, I needed to know more and I needed to see the la different land management strategies uh, that the managers use over there. So basically I was able to interview a lot from the team. And uh, basically from what I understood, uh, interviews was that they tried to implement uh, various practices that aim for the conservation, protection, sustainable use of resources. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, and the, the restoration of degraded land in the different zones, but they were not, but they had a small problem that they couldn't address all the different zones. They, they mostly couldn't address the transition um, area. Uh, so basically, according to news, I was able to know that in the core area, they allow for hiking and grazing, however, only on specific trails, and they prohibit agriculture, camping fires, and hunting in this area. And the buffer zone, uh, basically what they do is they try as possible within the people's lands and raise awareness to stop charcoaling and uh, grazing. And in the transition area, they don't really much have a management strategy. Uh, they try as much as they can to communicate with the village chiefs and mayors in order to raise awareness and they include the local communities and projects. So that's really great. So after that, I got, after I got the uh, interviews from the managers, uh, I was, I, I needed to uh, see whether the maps that I mapped coincide with what they said. So in reality, uh, this is the case uh, in real life. So to check if everything was uh, coherent. And finally, I used the invest model tool. This model uh, uh, uses two types of uh, basically the percentile model and the reg regression model. But however, in my study, I used the percentile model where I was able to quantify the yields of the food provisioning ecosystem services, which I chose in my study. And in order to generate these models, I needed to plug in the land use land cover maps from which I generated from the ArcGIS. And now that I have the, the final land use land cover map, the invest tool and all the land management strategies, allowed me to investigate and look and dig deeper into how the different farming systems or 
compares to existing systems in terms of overall production and how the crop is affecting the ecosystem services. All of this will, will be able, was or actually helped me uh, to see how we can improve the management of the biosphere reserve and suggest certain approaches to meeting the rising demand while also reducing the risks on ecosystem services. So uh, briefly about uh, the study area. So basically Jabal Musa was designated back in 2009. Uh, most of its landscape are mountain forests. Uh, it covers an area of 6,500 uh, hectares. Around 15,000 people live there. Uh, the main where there are small scale and large scale agriculture, such as crop production, fruit trees and beekeeping and ecotourism. And the organizing uh, and the managers over there are basically the APJM team. Uh, the biosphere reserves mainly focuses on uh, certain activities such as mountain preservation, uh, sensitization of the community to conserve uh, and uh, for sustainable development. Uh, uh, they do a lot of and we see a lot of small scale agriculture. Now, uh, linking sustainable development and conservation, some example measures are basically fostering collaboration between conservation and de development organization, as well as the private sector. Uh, we see that there's an increasing community awareness on conservation and development through demonstration projects. We see that there are a lot of uh, capacity building wor workshops for communities, and we see a lot of projects uh, related to sustainable resource use. And the two main uh, ministries in charge of legislations for the Biosphere Reserve are basically the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Environment. So if we wanted to look at the uh, zoning scheme of the Biosphere Reserve, we can see that in the protected area, it includes a lot of water bodies, dense forests, uh, oaks, scrublands, pines, rocky outcrops and rocks, as well as some fruit trees. And in the buffer zone, we can see that as well as, well as the poor area, uh, we, there are a lot of water body, body sorry, dense and clear oaks, uh, pines, scrublands, and fruit trees. And the transition zone, uh, it contains all of these that we mentioned above. On top of that, there are a certain areas where we can see uh, people extracting uh, minerals. So let's talk a bit about the management team. So basically the management team is composed of several people. We have the president, the vice president, the accountant, the board members, the secretary, treasurer, communication and agro-production coordinator, ecotourism, and uh, as well as many others. Uh, the team basically provides benefits to the communities, tries to improve ecotourism, prevents land degradation and waste management and raises community awareness and uh, tries to provide tree, uh, plant and tree propagations and manages wildfires. So if we had to look at the different economic advantages of Jabal Musa, we can see that the locals, uh, as well as others, mainly the main focus is basically is on ecotourism and agro products and sales. If we look at the table on the right, we can see that ecotourism has been flourishing from 2018 immensely. Uh, people are really loving and enjoying uh, hiking over there. And the locals are benefiting from their products, either selling them locally or beyond. However, Jabal Musa faces a couple of challenges. We can see that there are intensive uh, human activities such as mining, quarrying, building constructions and infrastructure, uh, infrastructures such as roads, sewer systems and dams. And we see a lot of people throwing garbage and waste dumps and littering everywhere, mainly if you see, uh, you can see like waste in the transition and the buffer area. There are a lot of people that are still hunting regard regardless of the no hunting rule. Uh, there are, we see a lot of grazing uh, cutting down trees for charcoal, for charcoal production. And we see that people are improperly cutting plants such as thyme. And over on top of all that, we see impacts from climate change and impacts recently due to COVID and the economic crisis that has hit uh, Lebanon. So basically, th th these were the maps that I was able to generate. So the first one, actually, the first one was acquired from the land use land cover. Uh, uh, the first one was acquired from the CNR, Lebanon CNRS, sorry. 
And uh, the second one was the one I generated from using ArcGIS with no fieldwork verification. The third one is, the, is, the, is where the different stakeholders pinpointed the different locations of different uh, ecosystem services. And uh, the fourth one is the overlay of one, two, three. So this is the, so the fourth one is the final map. And as we can see here, these are the results that uh, were generated from the invest tool. We can see the different quantities of the different crops and their distribution and how much is there in each, uh, in each area. So we can see that there has been intensive agriculture in all three uh, zones. Uh, and, uh, and we can see the different percentages uh, shown in the table below. So basically, uh, we can, as I mentioned before, that there has been intensive agriculture in all three zones of the biosphere reserve. And we do, and we all know that basically UNESCO prohibits any agriculture, intensive agriculture in the core area, which is not uh, the case here. And uh, so, so basically, instead of like uh, growing strawberries, apples, tomatoes, because this was the focus uh, of my study. So I, I would suggest maybe that uh, farmers could uh, remove the, these crop production and replace them with herbs. Uh, maybe because it's consistent with the core areas preservation concept. And maybe farmers can also grow native species yard incorporating flowers into crop rows or for pollinating insects and planting a windbreak. As for the two other zones, the buffer and the transition area, we know that in the buffer zone, basically this area is meant for ecosystem, uh, for sorry, sustainable development. And therefore farmers should consider maybe growing uh, rain fed and harvest crops uh, in this zone to replace the other three crops from, uh, that I mentioned. And uh, basically in the transition, uh, transition zone, uh, maybe uh, farmers might consider sustainable practices such as no-till agriculture, eliminating pesticide use in favor of complementary wild plants that repel pests and uh, using seasonal crop rotation. These practices might help reduce the impact uh, on the reserve's natural systems, which will help to support and expand biodiversity. We also have traditional farming techniques that, uh, that must be replaced with low-tech alternatives to improve the socioeconomic and environmental uh, benefits. So finally, to conclude with a bit of recommendations, I would probably suggest that maybe to provide incentives to farmers by renting out their land or swapping it for another piece of land in the core area, uh, instead of allowing them to grow there. Maybe we can involve uh, farmers in decision making and, uh, and maybe provide alternatives uh, to what they grow. Maybe provide a couple of funds to support sustainable agriculture, or maybe try to uh, uh, bring about co cooperatives that might uh, improve agriculture production and basically promote sustainable agriculture practices and innovation within the biosphere reserve. So basically as a conclusion, I, I believe that if uh, maybe the managers might consider uh, uh, these recommendations, it might improve some of the management practices in order to uh, ensure long-term sustainable uh, food provisioning for ecosystem services. And basically, this methodology that I used can be transferred uh, to other areas in Lebanon, uh, such as the Shouf Biosphere Reserve. Um, thank you. Thank you, Christina, for uh, a very interesting uh, study and, and very important because now we understand and uh, with your study, you have you brought out uh, uh, an aspect of the conflict because we always hear that there are conflicts, but here you have characterized the conflict. I just have a, um, a request for you. Can you go back to the result where you show the table and the map that shows where the agriculture practices are in the core zone? Yes, this one. I no, not this one. This okay. one, the next one. Yeah, I think this is a very important uh, slide, which in my opinion, you went over very fast. Can you elaborate a little bit 
for the audience uh, about the, these findings because they are very interesting in terms of uh, how much money they generate and uh, I mean how much uh, amount production they generate and where they are located primarily uh, at least uh, for the tomato I think at the time you focused on that uh, yeah tomato apples and strawberries yeah. so basically by looking at the uh, mod the three different models where we can see that there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, intensive agriculture for tomatoes apples and strawberries and the bias and uh, sorry buffer and transition area and we see a bit in the core area if you see the the coloring on top the tomato we can see that there's a there's a bit on the right top um, so and basically if we look at the table uh, below it, it quantifies exactly how much farmers have been growing uh, in uh, basically in the year uh, 2020. So because I got the image from August 2020. So I was able to quantify how much uh, farmers grew during this area. Uh, sorry, during this time, sorry. <laughs> uh, we can see that, for example, for the apple yield, for example, in the transition area, there's about 1,710 metric tons. And um, basically the most intensive crop uh, grown in these areas are the tomatoes. We can see it's grown abundantly. We see that in the transition area, there's around 8,000 uh, tons in the buffer area around 2.5 thousand tons. And in the core area, we have around 1.3. Um, the, the other two crops are a bit less, but however, they are still grown abundantly. So you can see the per different percentages of the different crops. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. Anyone has any questions, comments, please, the floor is open. Uh, I want to thank you, Christina, for this uh, very valuable study. Uh, it means a lot, really, that you have, uh, you have worked so hard, it seems. Uh, to be able to and i hope that we have uh, helped you enough yes thank you uh, i would like to add that uh, we know how much agriculture uh, can affect uh, in terms of uh, protecting the biodiversity especially in the core zone uh, so now, for example, we are working on a new project uh, to revive agricultural lands, but in the traditional way. So it's an ongoing project to, uh, to make an awareness and a training for many interested farmers to, um, to help them. Uh, uh, they have the ones who have dry stone terraces, the old terraces. Uh, to help them rebuild the walls, the stone walls, in the traditional way, meaning uh, not only the the way of uh, of building the walls, but also uh, how to uh, how what what to what to plant, which type of crops, especially the heirloom species, the native species, the ones that uh, do not need. Uh, much intervention in terms of pesticides and fertilizers. We are talking about, for example, the oregano, the za'atar, uh, lavender, uh, rosemary, and much more, uh, giving them also agroforestry trainings, as well as including such products uh, to, to, de to develop uh, food products from these, uh, from these crops. So this is for us, Maybe I am uh, going fast uh, for any questions, but I would like to, to tell you that we, we really work hard as the association to, uh, to promote and to, uh, to, to help the farmers uh, to awaken them, to, to make an awareness about what is important to protect and the biodiversity, but as well to help them uh, to help them have their agricultural economic value. For example, uh, it's been since 2011, we have a central kitchen 
that welcomes raw materials, raw products from uh, fruits to make jams, uh, forest honey, thistle honey, uh, the za'atar. So we make food products in collaboration with local women who are also attending many training sessions uh, in terms of hygiene measures, uh, the production, the recipes, in order to, to help as much as possible the local community, the farmers to, uh, to produce and to sell their products. And so we can as well uh, give, uh, give, uh, give new products to the market, especially the ones that are uh, the traditional ones. The, the rural ones that we say we call Mune in Arabic. So this uh, was uh, what I wanted to tell you to mention about our inter intervention regarding the agricultural practices. Thank you, Rula. Any questions, any comments from anyone? Anyone would like to ask anything? Yes, a uh, small question, please, a quick one. Uh, can we have uh, another, for example, I don't know, cooperation or similar study in another region with you, or uh, is it possible, I mean? Yes, I mean, this is uh, definitely, the research uh, possibilities are there. We have uh, the skills. Now, what is presented here is around uh, biosphere reserves, and this is the focus of our uh, research. So, but the skills are there, and of course, we are open to collaboration uh, and sharing our knowledge and our skills, definitely. Okay, thank you. I already sent a mail. I don't know if, uh, if anyone received it for uh, similar work in Jizin region. Okay, great, great. Uh, uh, Rula, I want to ask you something, looking at this slide again. Um, don't you think that this kind of information uh, will uh, help you have a more guided intervention? And if you look at uh, 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 the red map uh, in A, and you have a very specific topic, which is tomato production, and you have very specific areas that are where it's important to interfere in the, in the eastern side of the core zone. And at the same time, you have very specific quantities of tomatoes that are produced. So when you are, when you have this kind of information, then you have a, a more a more clarity on what is the economic revenue of the farmer? And so when you are thinking of alternative interventions, at least you know that you should be matching what the farmer currently produces. What do you think about um, what I am proposing? Yes, I totally agree with you. Uh, for example, we are already purchasing uh, tomatoes from this core zone area, from the producers there, to produce tomato paste uh, as a rural product that we sell. So this is an example. Uh, we would also like to produce, to, to try new products that, uh, that we are looking for with the food expert. Uh, but do you mean in terms of, uh, you mean in terms of agricultural practices? No, Anna, I mean, and you have a, one of the issues is to work with farmers and to promote alternatives. So in this case, in this study, uh, you have mapped the areas of where you have, if you want the problems coming from agriculture. And if you yes. look at the dark red, and you can focus your attention uh, and, and you have specific crops and specific yields. I mean, instead of, because you said, we have workshops and it's open to any farmers and we encourage them to grow, which is very important, but uh, maybe because there is so much to do, this kind of information can help you uh, have a more targeted intervention in very specific zones. And then you have an informed uh, approach and you know and know uh, 
you are working with these farmers and when you tell them to grow lavender or za'atar or whatever, ahead of time, you need to find out whether they will have the same economic revenue so it becomes easier for them to accept alternative uh, agriculture. And when yes. you come with this information, with something like this, I think your negotiation, uh, you, know, you, are, you're, you're, you can leverage this kind of information to have a stronger negotiation uh, with the farmers. Then when you have open-ended uh, workshops, anywhere they are invited, whoever wants to attend, etc. But Tony, maybe you can reduce can you reduce your scope, but have more in depth and focused? You know, and I see from these maps, I see that the, the, the southeast, the southeast part of the biosphere has the most agriculture encroachment. And this is like the, the most critical uh, area based on these maps, at least. Yes, yes, you are right. I know definitely these maps will help us a lot uh, to define uh, uh, where we need to where we need to assist uh, to to target some. Uh, uh, how much some to missing. compensate? And how much yes. to compensate? And if you know, Masalan, you know they have uh, eight thousand metric tons of tomato with the current yes. price, today's price. You know exactly how much money they're generating. And so then you can make an educated guess to see what would be a good alternative. Exactly. We can make, for example, also new products for tomatoes if they are, uh, if they are insisting on. Yes, absolutely. Or also modifying the practices. If then you can uh, observe tomato production and then invest in sustainable tomato production for example, to make sure that there is the least impact on the uh, biodiversity and the environment. So if anyone has any comments, uh, any questions? Okay, I think uh, uh, it's time to thank Christina for your yeah. uh, presentation. Uh, hello? Yes, yes, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, okay. Sorry, Salma, I was uh, mute. I was trying to ask. Um, I was wondering because this is like a, a comprehensive work for all uh, trades. I mean, we are very um, many here working together on this, each one on, its, on his or her own uh, art. Uh, like, did you, in, for instance, when you want to support and you did say that what are the needs, but did you look at the physical infrastructure uh, that the farmers may need? I, I missed a part of the presentation. I had to just attend to something else. So whenever you, you say support, it can be in workshop, it can be in promoting, and it can be actually in mutually collaborating because they can teach us, we can, you can probably give them some insight. But what about the uh, the support that they may need. Do they have the infrastructure? Whenever you do such a study, uh, do you look at the infrastructure available, physically, like the water, the, the irrigation, everything and the, that they need? Um, did you have a look at this? Because this may have a major impact on promoting this uh, whatever agriculture, including uh, whatever you are promoting to as sustainable and uh, alternative. Um, and perhaps another thing, I mean, again, uh, whenever you look at this as a biosphere, and then it has a lot of uh, features, like other than, I mean, you know, the, the hiking, the promotion of the sustainable tourism. Uh, would, did you look at, I mean, how much do you have um, in terms of um, uh, people coming in and out? Because, you know, the, the work is to sustain the whole thing together so that this urban agriculture works. I think you may not because you're doing one part, but this is probably where all the work will be integrated at the end to have one comprehensive study of everything to, to, to promote the whole uh, the holistic approach that uh, we're talking about. But do you have a, a, a side look at these things or not? Again, I missed the part, so maybe you discussed that. Um, yes, actually, I was able to acquire a table from years 2018 to 2020 to check how many people are visiting the biosphere reserve uh, and how many people are paying for entrance fees for the hiking trails. 
uh, from the APGM team, from the managers. And uh, basically for the infrastructure, as I mentioned that, yeah, the farmers do need funding. Uh, they do not have the means for uh, certain means for uh, um, sustainable agriculture. This is what I did mention in the recommendations that they might need funding uh, to be able to do so. Uh, th that's exactly the point. I'm not sure if anyone is working on that. Now, when you say funding, it's to fund probably their own, uh, uh, let me say little work, which is big. But uh, I'm talking about the, the, the global uh, infrastructure that can support the whole, uh, uh, the whole group of the farmers in that area. Uh, is there anyone who may be looking at this? Uh, because again, individual funding can support their, each their work individually. Uh, but then is it an equipped area to be able to sustain this as a, uh, as in, rural uh, development of the whole uh, agriculture of the area, not just individual. I'm not asking that you have done it or not, but is there anyone that uh, is looking into this as a global uh, uh, support for the area? I mean, what's existing in infrastructure? Is it enough? Is there any um, needs that the municipality should provide? Or I mean, the supporter, the funders should provide other than individual funding? Uh, so when I went on site visits, uh, farmers were telling me that basically, uh, as well as the manager, uh, no, actually the farmers. So they were saying basically that uh, municipalities are not helping in this sense. Uh, uh, for the question uh, for global funds, honestly, from my half, I don't really know if there's any fundings globally. Uh, I'm sure there is, but from my side, I, I really don't know. So, but yeah. So. I think Munir, you, know, you raise an important point because there are you know, the complexity of biosphere reserves is that you have on one side you have conservation, on the other side you have ecotourism, you have uh, uh, local production, sustainable agriculture, and every discipline is a layer and by itself at, at the same time they need to be integrated. Uh, what uh, you know, the, what Christina has done is to get the process started to say look in detail at the agriculture and let's start with the existing practices and the existing crops to develop a sustainability model based on what they are already doing and also this is what Rula is saying that we are start they are trying to work with the existing crops and the farmers uh, that are there. But uh, I don't know, Rula, do you have any project that looks at sustainable agricultural development for the Jabal Musa Biosphere Reserve? Yes, uh, just one, before I, I miss this, I, I wanted to say to Dr. Munir that the problem in our Biosphere Reserve in Jabal Musa is that if you look at each surrounding village, not all of them have municipalities. For example, we only have Yahshush and Ghbali who have municipalities. If you go to Kermes, where the tomato crops are mostly planted, and there is no municipality in Kermes. We only have the Makhatir, the Mukhtar, the, the, the head of the village that we call Mukhtar. So this is an issue also. This is why uh, we try to support them as much as possible, and uh, they rely that the, the state can help them in many things, such as Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, regarding the, the, your question, Dr. Salma, uh, we, uh, we are working also on such, uh, on such project, as I told you, uh, we wish to, 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 uh, to raise awareness on the sustainable agriculture, such as uh, the composting methods, uh, everything related to, uh, to agroforestry in terms of, uh, uh, of small lands selected at farmers. Uh, we cannot target the whole biosphere reserve, but step by step, uh, we, we are trying to reach this, uh, uh, this target. And uh, we, we're going to start now actually doing so. But earlier, before, uh, we didn't have the, the opportunity to work on such things, on the agriculture, on the sustainable agriculture practices, because uh, already it is new to, 
to to explain to farmers and it's difficult to to make them transit from their conventional ways to the new ones which are much more difficult to them but uh, we will do so with the with the most the closest i mean the closest area and the core zone uh, of course uh, targeting or arriving to the to the buffer and the transition zone is a difficult part now but hopefully we can do it one day Thank you, Rula, and thank you all for uh, attending this seminar session. And uh, as we indicated before, these will be uh, the the presentation has been recorded and it is compiled in a Google Drive document that is available to all. And if anyone needs a specific uh, presentation, please communicate with us, and we will make sure to share it with you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week with a new topic and a new face to talk again about uh, Biosphere Resource. Have a great day and we'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone.